think so. Got it. That was my little glitch last time as I totally forgot till we started the speakers. So this is why we have an introductory slide this time. So I'm going to just give just a few more minutes because we got started a little bit late. So almost everybody can get in. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about Meet the Teachers and, oh, I just got my little screen thing back up. Um, and about the quilt show just so that we're all on the same page as why we're here. Because I hope we're all going to the Minnesota Quilt Show, right? Yes, we are. June 15th through 7th. So this is my first bag. I have not used it or sold it because it's special to me. It was my gateway. <laughs> so um, ever since then, I've been making lots and lots of bags. Um, I do teach bag making at Twin Cities Quilting um, here in the Twin Cities in Arden Hills. A um, couple times a month, and that's really fun. Um, so I'm going to be teaching two bag making classes at the show this year. Um, one on Wednesday all day class and one on Saturday all day class. So I'm just going to show you the pattern, talk a little bit about um, the bags and how easy they are to do. I know a lot of people in my classes either have never done zippers or are um, intimidated by zippers, but they're really super easy. So the first one I'm going to do on Wednesday all day class is called the Portland Tote. This is what the pattern looks like. Um, this is done by Sotac Company. Um, Svetlana Sotac does these patterns and she's very, very good. Um, these one, this one is only available on PDF. She does not sell it in paper. So it's on Etsy um, under Sotac Co. S-O-T-A-K-C-O. -O, um, and it's the Portland Tote. Um, it is 11 inches tall. 12 inches wide and four inches deep. So it makes a really good work bag. It's kind of like a briefcase style. I am a newly retired nurse and I carried one of these to work with me all the time, often with just my coffee mug and some stuff. So here's the first one. This one is made out of canvas, but it's not wax canvas. So it doesn't have to be wax canvas. You can do it either way. This front pocket can be the same color or a different color. Um, it's got a magnetic snap right here. It's got webbing handles that are adjustable with a slider, and it's got leather handles here. Um, it's also got a zipper in the top part here, a recessed zipper, and then a zipper pocket on the inside and a slip pocket on the out inside as well. And it just zips closed like that. It stays very secure. Now, I really like to use these um, nylon zipper by the yard. You could use the, um, the commercial ones that aren't that way. This is how they come, like this. They look like metal, but they're nylon, and so you can cut through them, you can sew them, you can cut them to length. They come with zipper pulls on them, and they're in all different colors. Um, they do sell this also at Twin Cities Quilting and a lot of different stores. Pretty much any place that sells bag making supplies is going to sell those. Um, if, you, if you choose to have leather, if you want leather, they are sold at Twin Cities Quilting. My other bags use rivets. If you buy the leather, the rivets and the uh, um, washers and everything come with it. So there's that one. We're not gonna have kits put together for these ones, um, but the Wax Camp is, is available at Twin Cities Quilting. It's also available online. Um, A.L. Francis is one of the places on Etsy that sells lots of wax canvas. I get a lot from them. Um, and zippers, you can get those from, um, my handmade space, or pretty much if you just go in zippers by the yard, you can find them. All right. This is another one I made. Same kind of thing. This hardware is available at just about any quilt store that sells bag making supplies. Um, it says in the class list how many of these pieces you need. And then this is the last one. This is also wax canvas. All right. Um, my other bag that I'm going to teach on Saturday all day is called the Redwood Tote, and that is by Noodlehead. She makes a lot of patterns, and they're very popular. This is my most popular class that I teach in the shop, um, and that's an all-day class on Saturday. This one, any of these, you can make them out of canvas or wax canvas. This canvas color is called Whiskey, which is one of my favorites. It's got a zipper pocket in the front here with a lining on it. There. It's got a slip pocket on the back and it's got the leather handles and the rivets like I was saying. 
Now, for all these years that I've been um, making these bags, I've just hammered these rivets with a piece of granite and a hammer. Um, and because I make so many, I finally treated myself and got a rivet press, which is, let me see if I can find it here in my sewing room, right there. It's, it's only about $100 total. It does a perfect job, it's just a little kerchunk and it just sets them right in. These are mostly just straight line. You do need a zipper foot, but the zippers again are really easy to put in. There's nothing tricky about them. This one is canvas, but not wax canvas. And again, it's got the same things, same design. This one has handles that are made out of canvas instead of um, leather. So they just sew on, they don't need rivets. And this um, crossbody instead of leather is webbing. So you can do any of those combinations. And then this last one, which I know Maureen really likes, is also wax canvas. So you can change up how these, these center panels and these side panels and on the back, there's a center panel like this and then a pocket. So um, again, if you buy the leather from Twin Cities Quilting, these rivets and these little washers come with it. Um, the washers are so that the, the rivets don't pull through the fabric. It gives it some strength, all right? Um, if you want to see more of my bags, my Instagram is um, wallaby, it's W-A-L-L-A-B-E-E -E underscore bags. Um, and they're all, everything I've made, I put on there. It's, it's public, it's open. Um, if you want more inspiration from what other people have made on the Portland tote or Redwood tote, um, the Portland is hashtag Portland tote, all together one word. Um, and the other one is hashtag Redwood Tote, all together one word. And there's lots and lots of inspiration there. Um, you can see all different colors, different ways that people put it all together. Um, and it's just really fun. And you will have, there is some homework ahead of time because if you, um, we need to get things cut ahead of time so we can start sewing. And if we do that, then you will go home with the finished bag at the end of the day. The very first class I taught, I didn't realize that. And so we did all the cutting and interfacing ahead of time. And it was really a challenge to get done. So if you just do cutting, there's no templates, it's all rotary color and ruler. ruler. Um, and if you get that all ready to go, then we just hit the ground running and you'll go home with a finished bag at the end. I'm excited to teach it. We're so excited to have you. It's um, Thank you. I've, I've made these bags. I do that Frida Kahlo bag is mine at the end of the show. <laughs> I'm buying that one from her. So. Yeah. Um, Nobody else has dibs on that one. So, <laughs> that Maureen's anyone, name. <laughs> yeah, it's got my name on it. Does anyone have any questions or has, is there anything in the chat, Teresa? Well, again, let's address the, the kit concept. So where exactly, where would we be getting like the leather and the hardware supplies? Um, so if, if you have an opportunity to go to Twin Cities Quilting, Faye has, she knows where all it's needed. You, you need to get the pattern, first of all. And it lists everything you need. She does carry all the hardware. She carries several different colors of leather and the rivets and the washers that go with them. You can get them from them. You don't have to use leather. You can use webbing. And that you can get pretty much any store. I'm sure Gruber's has it too because they sell bag making supplies. Um, the only thing that might be a little tough is to find leather. And then I had a question um, that that rivet press that you have, would you uh -huh. bringing that along to the class? Yes, that's a good question. I am going to bring that along because it's so much quicker. I'm also going to bring I have this piece of marble that I got for free because it's just trash for the, the marble um, discount place and then a hammer so we can do that so more people can be working at the same time. But yes, I plan on bringing um, all those things with me and I'll probably I'll bring extra rivets and washers and stuff like that too. Wow, that's what we have. Does anyone have live questions before we move on? Hey, I think we're I think we're questioned out here. <laughs> we're good. Okay, I'm. Thank you so much, Barb. I'm gonna Thanks. put Sue on next, and we can learn all about dye. There you are, Sue. Go to it. Okay. Um. So I started dyeing fabric 
probably about six months after I learned to quilt. Um, when I learned to quilt, I was in the state of Wyoming and we had one little itty bitty quilt shop. And we were very grateful for that one little itty bitty quilt shop, but I always got very frustrated that all my work looked like everybody else's work in town. So I bought a book with a friend and we bought some dye powders and started playing. And one of the things that has stuck with me throughout all my dyeing or all my quilting is by dyeing my own fabrics, by making my own fabrics, my work always has a little bit more of a unique look to it just because I've put in a little bit of extra effort because I can use my own colors. I'm not limited by what the fabric companies are putting out for colors or for patterns. So um, that's my little um, reason behind what I do. So the first class that I'm teaching Wednesday morning is about printing fabric. And I am going to ask everybody to bring a print board. And they, this is basically just home insulation that is covered with a piece of either fleece or quilt batting. And then you can cover it with plastic, but what I really like to use is this um, painter's paper is what it's called. You buy it at the hardware store and it absorbs the moisture and the paint so you don't get anything bleeding back on a new piece of cloth. And so if I put a piece of cloth over here, all the writing and stuff wouldn't get absorbed into a, a white piece of cloth. Um, it's pretty easy to do. I just either use duct tape or T-pins to stretch each layer across the piece of um, foam core board. And you can get a half inch or three fourths inch or an inch wide piece of home insulation and cut it down into workable sizes because it comes in 10 foot or eight foot sections by four foot sections. Um, and when we're doing this class, I have a variety of stencils and Thermofax screens and you can use masking tape to create your own patterns. And you can vary the color going across a piece and just do one single layer of patterning, like what I've done in these pieces. Wow. But then you can go back in afterwards and add a second layer of color or pattern to really create something that's more dynamic. And so these are just a few of the pieces that I've done over the years. I do have some that are words which create a neat texture behind. And again, you can layer it or you can leave it as one layer so people can read what was written. Um, as you can see here, I have a variety of textures and they can be layered as well. Um, it's a fun class. There are so many different ways of using this. Um, I'm hoping we, we get to explore all of it in a three hour window. <laughs> um, but I think it, it's a good start into um, learning about the process so that you can do this and gain confidence enough to do it on your own later on if you want. Um, the second class that I'm teaching is a basic fabric dyeing class. And there are essentially three exercises that we will go through. And the first one is a simple color gradation. So you'll be going from a dark color to a light color and we'll learn how to make that gradation um, and how that all works. And you will get to choose what colors you work with. Um, I will bring a red, a blue, and a red, blue, and yellow. And then you will be able to uh, mix your own colors from those three basics. And with those three basics, you're not limited to just a green 
um, with the three basic colors, you actually can mix over 150 colors from just those three. It's all based on your proportions and stuff. And again, I'll go over this in class. But the first exercise is basically just doing a color gradation. Um, there, are, I've got a whole slew of all the different colors that you can go through to do. And then the second exercise that we do is a color to color exercise. So you pick the two colors that you want to get, and then you will dye the range of colors that are in between. So this one starts with yellow and orange and goes through all the different colors that come in between. They don't necessarily all have to be high chroma colors. You can work in pastels if you prefer. And here's another pastel one that goes from pink to orange. So you get all those nice salmon-y colors in between. Um, and then the third exercise is working more in a different direction. Um, these we add soda ash afterwards. The third exercise, we'll be adding soda ash to our fabric um, before we add the dye, which gives it a whole different dimension of how you work. And so you can either do a color ombre. So this one is a rainbow ombre. It starts with the red and goes through orange and yellow and green and blue and purple. Or you can do a multicolor piece, which is over here. And again, these were on the, the, the samples that I sent. So um, here's a multicolor strip, like a rainbow ombre, um, a multicolor piece. And then you can do a single color ombre that is all in one piece of fabric. Um, that class, you'll need to bring some baggies and have um, some gloves, but most of the supplies will be something that um, you'll be purchasing in a kit. You will need to buy, bring your own fabric. And I highly recommend finding um, Robert Kaufman PFD or Test Fabric 400M as your two base fabrics, because I know those two dye very well. Um, most people, when they aren't happy with the results, it is because of the base fabric that they use. Um, a lot of fabrics are treated with sizing and other finishes that block the dyes from getting to the fabric in creating vibrant color. So all they, even though the amount of dye they put on the fabric should have resulted in something like that, this is all they come away with. Um, so, those are, if you're going to buy, buy your own fabric, um, those are the two I would highly recommend you look for. Um, I do have 400 test 400 M fabric that I can bring, but that is something the students need to let me know that they need ahead of time. So I know to bring enough of that. Um, with the print class, um, their fabric is included in that kit fee because it has to be pre-treated. Um, I think that's all I, I have. If anybody's got questions, can you order sure. supplies individually? Oh, I think that's for the last one. Okay. Could you no. put in the chat about those, the types of fabric that you need for your basic class? Again, that 400, uh, all the those things. In Robert Kaufman, yep, I'm happy to do that. Yep. PFD and about how much yardage that people should bring? That's I on the supply list, but yes, I can add that in. Okay, that would be great. Okay. Um, the one I thing we should mention is where um, Sue is having her classes because it's a different place than everybody else's. So we are uh, going to have Sue's classes at the Paramount Theater because they have a classroom that can get dirty. I mean, we won't <laughs> go by dye splashed all over the walls and the floors, but it'd be better than the carpet. 
at the river's edge. So need to keep that in mind. Uh, the Paramount Theater is walkable. I would say it's two to three blocks, city blocks. Um, but if you sign up for one of Sue's classes, know that you're, it may not make sense to buy a box lunch because your box lunch will be at the river's edge, but they're half day classes. So I guess it would work. You go to the class at Paramount, walk back at your box lunch or vice versa. So just want you to be aware that it's not at the river's edge. Thank you, Brenda. And it's gonna be beautiful on that day. There will be no rain on that day, so it'll be a nice <laughs> little walk. <laughs> I'll be driving because I'll have gallons of dye to yep. <laughs> so if it rains, we'll see how many people fit in my car. Yeah. <laughs> so do you want to mention some things about your couple of lectures that you're going to also be giving? Sure. Um, I behind all these lovely colorful things you will see, I also work in indigo shibori. Um it's been the direction that my work has gone in the last few years. And so um, I have a lecture that basically explains the indigo shibori and why I've gone that direction and shows you much of the work that I've been doing. Um, one of the pieces that's included in that lecture is what will be in Quilt National this spring. So I'm very excited about that. Um, so that's my journey to Indigo Shibori. Um, the other lecture that I'm giving is um, on mark making and how I would like to expand the definition of mark making um, beyond just um, people who use thickened dyes or paints on fabric. Um, it's essentially talking about how you make your quilts your own and, and developing a distinguished voice. Thank you. I'm looking forward to those. It's going to be wonderful. Thanks. And congratulations on the Quilt National. That's exciting. Yeah, I'm very excited about it. Any questions, Teresa, that you can see there? I'm not seeing any come through, um, but I always have this question about dyeing and that's color fastness. How, how do we deal with that? <laughs> Procyon dyes are the most color fast dyes that are out there right now. They, they are the same thing that your sheets and your clothing are all dyed with. So okay. once you get all the, the fugitive dye out of the fabric meaning as long as you've rinsed it enough you it's color fast it won't fade any more than any other fabric that's out there because it is the same dyes that the fabric that you buy at the fabric store are dyed with that's good to know it's a, a bit of a change from um 30 40 years ago when i was in design school so yeah yeah <laughs> I mean, the, the, the Procyon dyes are so much, I don't want to say are better than, but you get much deeper, darker colors than you do with Rit dyes. And they are also more color fast than Rit dyes. So um, it is a different class of dye. Um, and whether you use, I use them with the thickened dyes. So both classes are using the Procyon dyes. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, right. Yeah, thank you. You're I noticed that uh, Brenda put in there, Sue will also be one of our judges. So yeah. you've got a really busy week with us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, can't wait to uh, meet you and see you there and everybody sign up for those classes. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks. You're welcome. I will uh, pop up Renee Merrill here next. There you are, Renee. Are you ready? You are on. I'm ready. <clears throat> so I've still got a little bit of frog on my throat. I'm not sure why. Hello, everyone. I'm Renee Merrill, and I'm really excited to be coming back to Minnesota this year. This time, last year I was a vendor. This time I'll be teaching. 
and um, I'm bringing a variety of classes. Um, the, there are, are some classes of, that are done in spiral foundation piecing, which is the topic of my first two books. And then about, um, oh, about eight years ago, I decided that if I was going to call myself a professional quilter, I should know how to actually quilt my own quilts. So I embarked upon the task of learning to do free motion quilting. And in the process of doing that, I developed a method for learning that's based in my experience as a concert pianist and a piano teacher. And it's unlike anything that you've ever seen for teaching free motion. Um, I taught this class three times last week in different places online and here in Colorado. And at the end of every class, somebody said, it's like a miracle. I never imagined I would be doing this much this fast. Um, in the one day class, free motion mastery and a month quantum leap, we will be going from straight lines to feathers. And you will be able to do it even if you have failed at free motion before or you've never done it. Um, and I'm going to pop up a little bit, a little video right now. It's, you can find this on YouTube. It just kind of shows you the process and gives you a sense of why this is different. Um, so give me just a second to pop this up and get it going. And let's see, this should be it right here. That should be that right there. Um, that's not what I was looking for. Sorry about that. That's the project that you'll finish at the end of the first class, uh, at the end of this class. But let me find this. I had it ready to go. And of course, now it's not showing me where. Oh, here we go. All right. All right. Hi, I'm Renee Darrell, the creator of the Motion Western Group. You know, Learning from motion quilting can be kind of challenging. And whether you're doing it on your own or whether even if you try it with a class, often it goes like this. Here's a pattern. Now quilt it. Oh, you can't do it yet? Well, just practice, practice, practice. The problem is, you go home and practice. You don't really know what to practice, how to practice, and you don't get very far. And then you get frustrated, and maybe you even just give up and say, that's it, I can't do this. Well, free motion mastery in a month is a different approach. And it deals with two problems is what I just described to you. The first problem is that between here's a pattern and here's how quilted, you need to train your body how to move in order to make that happen. And most approaches just don't deal with that movement question. The second problem is that when you go home and practice, 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 if you don't practice right, you just get really good at doing it wrong. So um, what I did when I created the machine that's with a month is I created a day-by-day, step-by-step practice plan that takes a pattern, teaches you how to move, helps you through the process, and then teaches you how to practice it in three simple steps. So here's how it works. I'm going to show you in this little excerpt right here. Um, and I'll back to the here a little bit more. The first exercise is this quilting yoga. Simple whole body motion that set you in right leg and speed with quilting. You use a large muscle to keep the smaller quilting muscle. You use the master training tool and facing sheets to learn muscle memory for the specific design you're learning and coordinate your hands together in parallel motion. The third exercise is drawing. This is where your brain creates a map of the design so it can tell your hands where to go. Notice that all of that happened before you got to the sewing machine. Now you go to the machine and quilt the design, and you can do it. It works because you learn one skill at a time, then put them together. Free motion master in a month is a book, a toolkit, and an optional video class that takes you step by step, day by day, through simple lessons that can lead you to do motions and the patterns of free motion quilting. It works for any kind of sewing machine, gymnastics, sit down long arms, and long arms. And as you work through the lessons, you're going to learn about 50 patterns. But more importantly, you're going to learn the fundamental shapes and patterns and movements that make all quilting patterns work. There's even a bonus chapter on the book. Okay, so let's stop right there. Hang on a second. Let me get this to stop. Hold on. Okay. So there we go. So in the in the um, the full day class, uh, then there's also two half day classes where the full day class is split in half. Um, if you're a total beginner or if you've failed before, take the full day class or take the first half of the class. 
Um, if you've got a little bit of experience with free motion, um, you can at least move at a comfortable speed and get an even stitch, then jump in on the second half class um, where we'll do teardrops, spirals, and S-curves and build them into several different fill patterns and a variety of feathers. Um, so this is a really fun class and it really, it, it's, it's just not like anything you've ever had before for free motion. So it's so much, I love teaching this class because I really feel like um, helping people get the fundamentals solidly under their belts at, as a first step of learning free motion quilting makes everything else work. And building that confidence and that comfort at the sewing machine makes everything else work. So I, I, I just love being like the beginner teacher for free motion quilting. I, there's a lot of other things I could teach, but I really love this because I just love seeing students succeed at this. Um, is, it, I, I'll, is there's any questions about free motion right now? What do we can we take them and then I can switch over to the other um, the other topics? I'm not seeing anything in the chat right now, so I think you can go ahead on to spirals next, perhaps. Actually, I'm going to go over to t-shirt quilts. Let me okay. see where, where do my pictures go here. Um, so what was really cool about here we go. Here we go. All right. So um, one day, so when I doing when I'm doing free motion, um, I I quilt a block a, a block at a time, and I use double sided batting um, to hold the layers together. Du sorry, double sided fusible batting to hold the layers together. And one day I woke up and I thought, you know what? You could use that same double sided fusible batting to do t-shirt quilts, and you could quilt your t-shirts one at a time. So I embarked upon an adventure of quilting t-shirt quilts. And this is this one here I call my uh, King Tut t-shirt quilt because all the words, all the t-shirts have power phrases on them. And I really had a lot of fun, fun embellishing these. Let me see if I can. Um, so here's an example of a t-shirt that it started out just saying chocolate. And then I took fusible applique and satin stitching around the edge and I used decorative stitching on the words. And I completely decorated this t-shirt as I was quilting it because I was doing it before I put it into the quilt. So when we do this, this class, um, we're going to do, uh, we're gonna take a t-shirt, bring your own t-shirt. We're gonna all introduce um, how to use the double-sided fusible batting. I will teach you a beginner's course on free motion. Even if you've never done free motion quilting before, you'll be able to quilt your t-shirt. We'll talk about ways to embellish, and I'll teach you how to put the quilts together with quilt as you go techniques, or how to put it together to make a pillow. Um, and it's really a fun way to do free motion. Uh, it's really a fun way to do a t-shirt quilt because you're not dealing with a great big, heavy, stretchy quilt. You're not adding um, additional stabilizer. You don't even have to plan the quilt in advance. You literally can just take the t-shirt, fuse it up, start quilting it, and have fun, and then you know, adding the quilted t-shirts to your collection. And then when everything is quilted, then you can figure out your layout and put it all together. Um, and it's just, it's so much fun to do this. Let me go back to this quilt here. Oops. So if you look at this quilt, uh, you can see the chocolate quilt is right here in the middle of this one. And you can see how this whole quilt was all pieces that were quilted before and then put together afterwards. Um, a really fun thing about this is that you can even pre-quilt your borders and I have a technique for pre-binding your borders. So you actually put the binding on the borders before you attach the borders to the quilt. And believe me, when I have a quilt, I did one of my t-shirt quilts that had 20 t-shirts in it that were all 18 inches square. And the quilt was 84 by 104 and it weighed 10 pounds. And believe me, being able to quilt my borders and attach them with the binding on them first saved me a heck of a lot of manhandling getting that quilt through the sewing machine. So it's a technique I use a lot now on a lot of different quilts. I love it. And so you're going to learn a lot of stuff in this class about doing t-shirt quilts, embellishment, quilting, quilt as you go, binding, just lots of great stuff. Um, let me stop the share here. And then we have um, a class that's called uh, Simply Amazing Baravel Spirals. And this is, so uh, Baravel Spiral is a spiral that gives you, it's, it's um, all, Foundation piece, there we go. And uh, it's really versatile. So you can, not, you can make not only spiral, um, spirals, but you can do lightning bolts, pineapples, 
rings, just all kinds of crazy things with this. So we'll explore um, the, uh, the, um, the structure of a Veravel spiral. Here, I'll just pop up some examples here. And different ways. So here's our basic Veravel spiral. Let me see, get a bigger picture here. There we go. So that's our basic sample for the class. And then we will find, we're going to explore different ways to vary them. So here's another one. It's a little wonky. Here's, this is a student's Veravel spiral. And I absolutely, this is one of my all time favorite ones. So um, you'll see lots of ways to do Veravel spirals. We will have time to sew one in class, I believe. And then you'll take the block home and use it as you want. Um, the last class, how am I doing on time? Am I doing okay on time? You're good. Yep. All right. So the last class is called um, Designing a Simply Amazing Spiral Quilt. And what's cool about this is that there, this is a fun class. You just bring markers and scissors and we go to town exploring how to put spirals together. So this is a the sample for the class. And what's really cool with this is when you put spirals side by side, um, you don't see spirals anymore. They, they go into these wonderful other shapes that look like hearts or fans or apple cores or ribbons. And there's, so we'll explore how to put, you know, how to start with a basic spiral and then how to create these wild and crazy designs um, using a couple of simple shapes. Um, and then, explore things like gradations and contrast and value and things like that to really bring depth and dimension to the designs. Um, this is a really fun class. It's very relaxing because it's just cut and color and take pictures and color some more, um, but you're gonna go out of this class with a really fresh vision of what you can do with, on a, with the quilt. This will be a, a really unique kind of new visual language that you can take into your own quilt making. So I'm um, really looking forward to being there and sharing these classes with you. I love teaching these classes. I love, it, my, my, my greatest passion is um, sparking other quilters creativity and giving them the tools to do something new and exciting um, that comes from their, their own hearts and their own sense of creativity. So I hope you'll join me and um, let's have some fun together and open some new doors to new kinds of quilt making. Wow. Thank you so much, Renee. That was a lot of color and spinnies and beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, it gets kind of woo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's but it looks challenging and some of us are looking for that. So I think you know, it's really actually fun. not challenging. That's the really cool part about it is that all of these all of these classes can be done by beginners. And um, even though it looks challenging, I take you step by step through a process in each case that makes it very doable and very understandable. Even, I mean, I've sometimes had people who are brand new quilters in these classes and they have as, they're successful, they're as successful with these techniques as anyone else who's been you know, quilting for a long time. So don't be afraid. If you're a newbie, come on in, you're welcome. Well, we'll get, you'll walk out feeling as successful as anybody else. Thank you so much. Any uh, questions in chat or anything, ladies? I do have one question from Ellen. Um, she's asking, does the Quantum Leap class cover the same design material as Intro 1 and 2, or are there differences between them? No, Intro 1 and Intro 2 are the first and the second half of Quantum Leap. Okay. You did. I think you guys did it that way so that you had the option for people to take some a half-day class if they were interested in that. Um, in both of them, you'll get the fundamentals of like setting your tension, setting up your machine, finding the perfect stitch length. Um, but in the, yeah, so the intro one and intro two are just the same thing as quantum leap split in half. Thank you, yep. And they don't need to take one, they can take two if they feel confident enough, they can just jump right into two. They can take two if they already have a, can sew at the, with a smooth rhythm and a smooth stitch in free, mo in, in free motion. Like if you're used to doing, if, if you can confidently do a stipple in free motion and get an even stitch, then yeah, come on in and just do two. Um, but we won't have time in two to cover like all the fun to fun, the most fundamental basics that we cover in one. So if you can already come in with, you know, a comfortable movement at the machine, then two will be perfect for you. Sounds great. Thank you so much.
It sounds like your techniques with t-shirt quilts would totally change a quilter's experience. They really do. And I've been trying for a year to get the book written. It's just I'm traveling so much this last year and a half. I can barely squeeze in, you know, opening my mail. But um, they do. It, it's so much fun to do it this way. And it was the quilt that I showed you is a quilt that I did during COVID. And like when things were really tough, I would just sit down with one of these power t-shirts and start cutting fabric and fusing things down and stitching and comb. And I just had a blast. And then you know, the collection grows on your wall and you keep rearranging and playing with them. And then finally it all comes together and it's like, wow. But it's just so freeing not to have to plan the quilt ahead of time. You can literally just get in and play and have fun and watch it develop and then put it all together when you're done. Sounds great. Because we all have those t-shirts, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's really daunting to try and do a great big t-shirt quilt. This way you can just do one at a time. And what I tell people is make pillows for now. And then you can always just cut the binding off the pillow and put it in a quilt later. So you can do one at a time and enjoy them and then, you know, not feel overwhelmed. That is great. Excellent. All right. Any other questions, anyone? Thank you, Renee. I think we'll move on to the next one. Which is Barb Kukluk. There we go, you are spotlighted, Barb. Thank you. Um, that was, it's fun listening to all the teachers. It makes me feel very, very beginner at this. But I have <laughs> taught for many, many years, but I teach locally and um, throughout Minnesota and into Wisconsin a little bit. But my classes um, are pretty much gonna deal with teaching people basics and moving them up the ladder into playing with other things. I have found that people, when they buy their sewing machines, say, I don't need the decorative stitches. I'll be still my heart. Um, I love the decorative <laughs> stitches. I think they just add a lot of pizzazz to the, to the basics without having to buy more stuff it's already on your machine and you already have your threads. So uh, my first class that I'm gonna talk about is basic applique and in basic applique, and I've just kind of got a little thing here. Um, I'm going to be talking a lot about um, what do you need to make your applique work? So in this case, we're going to be playing with pieces. We're going to be playing with basic stitches, basic circles, uh, squares, but we're going to be talking about what is the best size for the size of your applique, how wide, how deep, how long, what kind of stabilizers do you need on the back, are you doing woven on woven, are you doing woven on knit, are you doing knit on woven, all these things require different kinds of stabilizers and different kinds of methods, so basically we're going to sit down and play, as you can see on my little notes here, I write lots and lots and lots of stuff. And add, that's what I have you doing. What went wrong, what went right? How do I turn a corner so I don't have a buildup of threads? How come I missed a corner? How come this got jumped? Why do I have a space? All these things are things we cover and we just sit down and play with circles and squares because circles are curves and squares have sharp points and corners. And that is pretty much the gist of whatever you're going to do. So that is our first class. And um, I enjoy teaching it and I hope that people will come out and enjoy it. Um, the second thing is, now that we know the basics of applique, we're gonna go out there and we're gonna play with our stitches. And this is kind of a funky little thing, but as you can see, we have squares and we have hearts and hearts are curved in points. We have outside points and inside points. We have diamond shapes. We have stars. We are going to be doing fancy decorative stitches and you're going to get those on point. We are going to do layers. We have got satin stitches with layers of other stitches over the top. So it looks like we've got woven um, ribbon in there and it's all just thread. We're gonna learn how to do layering, what goes under what, what goes over the top of what. As you can see, this is where a person would start with the basic applique. This is where you go and you start adding decorative stitches to your applique. We can do some fill-in work. This is when you start having fun 
and let your creativity blossom by adding lots of extra work on it. I have embroidery, so we have to add a little bit of embroidery. I also color lace, add colored lace to the product. So in this, this uh, advanced applique class, we're going to learn how to layer, which, where do we start? Because we have fabric under fabric, where do we start, how far in? I try to teach you how to do it with the least amount of tie-offs, the least amount of um, extra threads and extra stitches. So that is kind of our advanced applique class. Um, I had a student in one of my classes who had made this beautiful mural and it was a old wagon wheel with um, an old um, wheelbarrow in it, leaves, trees, it was beautiful. But it was fabric that was applique on, she had put it on, she never stitched a stitch, she never finished it because it turned out so nice the way she did it. She was scared to touch it by sewing it down because she thought she would destroy what she had. And her friends kept saying, you have to finish the quilt. And to her, she said, it's as finished as far as I'm going to get. Once she took this class, she said, I have possibilities. So she said, I said, you start small. Don't try to do it all at one time. Just start with a little bit, add some stems, add some veins in your leaves. And then when you're feeling better about that, then you can add, maybe you finish your outside of your leaves. So you just continue on and work in that, that way. So that is, um, I hope um, people would enjoy that class. My next class is talking about using decorative stitches to do your quilting. And I don't know if you can see close up on here, but this is just doing a simple wave stitch. I stretch it out as far as I can get it. If your machine lets you change size, stretch it out. I did one line drawing. I, this is the front of it. And um, it adds a lot of texture and fun instead of just following stitch in the ditch. So it adds a little bit of character to the stitch. This is the class that we're going to do. This is OCD. This is, there's tons and tons of work on here. You can see it better from the back. Most people will not be quilting their quilts this way, but I want you to know all the different ways that you can quilt by following lines, by adding stitches. We can add stitches on, on right on our seams. We're going to do some border work. This is actually taking two stitches and putting them together in a sequence. If machine, and I'm just lucky that the machines in the, in the room happen to have sequencing. So those people who have sequencing will be able to go home and use their sequencing. So the other thing is using single motifs to change and just do one. And that is like a tie down. Instead of taking a yarn and tying, you can actually use your decorative stitch to do your tie downs on here. So this is my class on um, uh, uh, quilting with decorative stitches. Um, like I said, it's OCD. We're going to be in, doing in the ditch. We're going to be doing, I, I will be teaching you how to do it if you want to do it like regular quilting, pulling up your threads and then burying them. I'm going to show you how you can do it if you want to tie it off. Uh, the nice thing is I do have a sample that is, um, how would you say, kind of uh, blends in so you don't see it but the stitches are still there. We still have some of the decorative work around the outside. We have some stitch in the ditch work and we have some free motion quilting work on, on these. Um, I want this, like I said, my classes that I wanna teach are technique classes, which means I want you to see what you're doing. I want you to see what works and what doesn't work and uh, use that as your, um, kind of little Bible when you get home to be able to help you say, oh, I remember this stitch, but you can do it. Like I said, I did the same stitch here. It kind of floats in there a little bit, but it's not in your face. So you get to choose when you do them. The other thing is like, this is a sample. Instead of stitching in the ditch, I took a decorative stitch and I just followed a quarter inch away of everything. And everything is done with a little, um, kind of a little X type stitch. And I just did all my quilting of the design by using a decorative stitch instead of, and it just kind of helped play a little bit, enhance a little bit, add a little bit of character to what would have been kind of a basic, you know, mono monochromatic 
um, project. So that is my uh, quilting with decorative stitches. And I'm hoping that it gets people excited and able to do something a little bit more fun than just stitching in the ditch, but adding just a little more pizzazz to the projects that they do. And you don't need a lot. Sometimes you only need one of them, but I'm gonna teach them all to you as fast as I can in this class. <laughs> all right. My last class is called Crazy in a Hurry. And Crazy in a Hurry is going to be working with six color blocks. What we're going to do is we're going to be putting them together and you will be walking home with all your blocks finished. But these are some of the blocks and we're gonna be putting, you can choose to put leading in them. Um, I'm going to be setting up the kit so that there is leading in them. Um, this is done kind of a little bit of a stack and whack basis versus crazy fast. You can do them in any color you want. This is done in fall colors. This one I did and did as a pillow. And this one is done with uh, basically pastels, add a little bit of embroidery to it, and then played with some color on that. Then if you don't wanna do letting, we can also do it with decorative stitches. So this is one I did is very monochromatic. I don't know if it's kind of hard to see in here. I did monochromatic work with it, did some decorative stitches. So it's a little bit like your traditional crazy patch, which is some of the things I like, and it's my mother's passion. I do have blocks back here that I'm putting in, and these are also blocks that were done. And basically, I did six blocks. I did them this afternoon, took me about two and a half hours. I had all six blocks completely finished and ready to go. <laughs> so it's a fast way. We don't have to go back to hand stitching. We need to use our sewing machine stitches and have some fun playing with some crazy patch stitches. So that is pretty much in a nutshell my classes. So are there any questions for anyone? That was fabulous. It was uh, been there, done that, you know, uh, made those mistakes and <laughs> <laughs> afraid to try things. And then those you know, the points don't add up or my circles are going the wrong way. And so it will be really fun to learn the right way to do things. Thank you so much. Any questions in the chat? Not seeing questions in the chat. We have a very quiet crew. <laughs> so Brenda has uh, put in, we are supplying FAF machines for Barb's classes. So you'll have lots of decorative stitches to try out. You're our FAF person, so fantastic. Yep. And know that all machines have the stitches and all machines can do them. So <laughs> you don't have to feel like it's, you know, gotta be just that. Um, but there are, there's beautiful stitches on all the machines and I just really am out there. My, my um, students call me the um, queen of decorative stitches. They just know that everything I do tends to have to throw some of that in there. So. <laughs> All right. Any questions? Anything else? Brenda, do you want to wrap it up with uh, the show excitement and sure. where we're at? So I recognize a lot of the names on here because I've been watching the registrations come in. So I know that some of you have registered already. Um, just want to let you know that um, starting today is the 15th, right? So starting tomorrow, if you've already registered and because you've heard some class that, oh, I need to take this class now that I've heard one of these folks tonight and I need to get rid of that class or whatever. If you need to switch one class to another class, what we would like you to do is have us do it for you. And the reason is that if you were to drop a class, you would only get 80% of your money back starting tomorrow. And we want to make it a hundred percent switch for you. So um, if you're thinking of, of um, dropping one class, you can add another class and give us a call at the office. Um, I'm trying to remember our number. I think it's 651-224-3572. And we can pull up your record and do that for you so you don't lose any money. Um, you can always go back to your registration and add a class. We love it when you add classes, right? <laughs> um, so uh, don't delay. Um, if you, I do want to show one thing. Can I show that that tip about how to get to the class information? Um, 
I'm going to share my screen real quick here. Um, if you go to the website, um, there is one trick so that you can see the um, actual information about the classes. So I want to show you that a little bit. So our website is www.mnquilt.org backslash MQ2023. And when you click on the workshop page at the top, first you'll see all of our faculty, their profiles. And then um, there are some tips here. You can actually read the tips. That's why I put them there. Um, but the one thing that sometimes people don't realize is that we're, um, well, let's pick one that we have somebody here. Uh, here we go. So see the little carrot next to it? Click that. You'll see all sorts of things about Renee's class that she talked about. The supply lists are there, skill level, the fees, whether or not you need a sewing machine. And as I get sewing machine um, lined up with the vendors, I'll be adding that information here and saying that, yes, you need a sewing machine and it will be provided by so-and-so. Um, if there's a kit fee, that is something that you pay to the instructor directly when you get to the classroom. Um, a lot of times the supply list will tell you what's in that kit fee, so you have an idea. Um, if you are not seeing the picture for one of the classes when you click on it, um, that has to do with cookies and all that kind of computer stuff. Um, if you're not seeing like a picture when you do that, go to the top of your screen, hit the refresh or the reload button, and then it will actually work for you. Um, that has worked for me every single time. So. Um, that's just a little tip for you. Uh, the other thing I could tell you that uh, starting today, the quilt entry site is open and we opened it and one hour later we had our first entry. So you all missed out on being the first quilt entry, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you can enter your judge quilt, your non-judge, your challenge, your mystery and youth. Um, so that's available today. And the other thing that, um, is also open now is if you own a quilt shop, I don't know, Michelle, Melissa's still on. Okay, Melissa, quilt shop owner, um, if you wanted to um, sponsor a bus to the um, River's Edge, you could do that too. So there's information for quilt shop owners, or if you want to gather a small group of a guild or a small group of friends and get your own bus and have somebody drive you there and drop you off at the front door, we can <laughs> um, help you do that. So um, lots of fun stuff happening and check the website because we're always adding more information as we get things organized. So any questions Thanks. about the show that I could answer outside of the classes stuff? Oh, okay. Quiet group. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, Look forward to seeing those numbers just go crazy now that you've met the teachers and um, are going to sign up for all sorts of new classes. And thank you, teachers, for being here and sharing with us. It was wonderful to have you. And I look forward to uh, seeing everyone at the Quilt Show in St. Cloud, June 15th through 17th, right? <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> Thumbs up. Yeah.